Hi, I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, where we discuss the ideas, people, and events that have made America what it is today. We believe that by understanding our history and our principles, we can better live up to the promise of the American founding and preserve our ongoing experiment in self-government. Welcome to The American Idea. I want to welcome everyone to this episode of The American Idea. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most important fundamental ideas of America, of American politics, of American public life, and really of the whole way that our society functions. And that is an idea that perhaps some of our listeners have heard of, they might know something about, but do we really fully understand its meaning and its significance. And that is the idea of natural rights and limited government. I'm gonna be joined for the conversation today on this really important, important topic with our old friend, many of you know him very well, our old and dear friend, Professor Christopher Burkett. Chris is professor of political science at Ashland University. He is the academic director of Ashbrook's student programs, co-director of the Ashbrook Scholar Program. Chris teaches in Ashbrook's Master of Arts in American History and Government Graduate Program for Teachers. He also teaches in our Teaching American History seminars. He is a wonderful teacher who knows how to bring to life and illuminate really clearly important ideas that we all need to get to know more about. He's also a wonderful colleague and an old friend of mine. We've been colleagues in our department for a long time, working together in programs for students, teachers, and citizens. And I also have to say, he is an author and the editor, in fact, of one of uh, just an absolutely terrific book that I have to commend to all of our listeners. I always do when we have Chris on because it deserves commendation over and over and over again. You have to get your hands on this book. It's called 50 Core American Documents, Required Reading for Students, Teachers, and Citizens. It starts with the Declaration of Independence, and it ends with Ronald Reagan's I ha- uh, Time for Choosing Speech in 1964. So it has 50 of the most important documents that every American should read, understand, and know. Chris, thanks for taking the time to join us again today on The American Idea. Thank you, Jeff. It's always a pleasure. And you've, you've called me an old friend on several uh, podcasts before, but every time it gets truer and truer, and I, I feel it a little bit more every time we do a podcast. Well, let me so. tell you, you're looking well. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. You you too, by the way. <laughs> it's a All pleasure right. to be here, though. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of natural rights. I think it's probably a term that a number of our listeners have heard. Um but maybe they haven't heard it all the way since back in high school when they were studying civics or American history. And they certainly read the document important in American history that illuminate this idea. This idea of natural rights in the American founding, where would we find this idea most clearly articulated so we can start to dig into what it actually means? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, and it's a it's a great topic. It's an important topic because, as you said in the intro, um, this is a this idea of natural rights is built into the very thing that Thomas Jefferson described as the American mind. Right? We 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 claim that we believe in natural rights, we value them deeply, and they shape how we think about government and what the role of government should be and what the powers of government should be. So, um, interestingly enough. Um, the Declaration of Independence, which is our sort of, you know, our our cornerstone uh, that our political mind is built on, doesn't actually use the term natural rights, but the idea is there. Uh, it you, it describes certain rights as unalienable rights that are uh, that all men are endowed with by their Creator. Um, so the idea is there. The term natural rights isn't there. You do find, by the way, in various state constitutions that are passed right around the same time as the Declaration of Independence, the term natural rights. I believe uh, the Virginia, if I'm not mistaken, the Virginia Constitution and and Declaration of Rights passed in 1776 talks about natural and inherent rights. 
So the idea of natural or unalienable and inherent rights had been around in the American mind for uh, the better part of a century, uh, I would say, or, or at least 75 years prior to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So people had been had been thinking in these terms, they'd been hearing this idea of natural rights in their sermons, especially, by the way. Uh, it was amazing how many preachers were working these kinds of ideas, uh, talking about natural rights and and then you know the the, pro, the proper role of government into their sermons especially in the 25 30 years leading up to the to the american revolution but but the ideas have been there as, and growing as part of the american mind for for quite a long time before the declaration of independence was written so if i'm not mistaken i even think john jay uses it in the term natural rights in federalist number two uh, which was right. written to defend the constitution but kind of showing the connection there or the idea that this notion is in the minds of many Americans uh, at the time of the American founding. Um, what does the term natural rights mean? Yeah, great. Um, a, a right itself is is a is the you know the power to do a thing, right? If, if you want to define what a right is, it's the ability or the power to do a thing. And what makes a right f natural, in the according to the American mind, is that that your natural rights are bestowed upon you not by government not by society not by other human beings your natural rights are not created by by man they're not created by human beings they are yours by virtue of the fact that you are born a human being they are endowed you're endowed with these certain rights unalienable or natural rights you are endowed with them by nature or as the declaration says by your creator or by the by the god of nature if you want to you know look at the first paragraph of the declaration of independence these are rights that are not given to you by any human being you have them simply by the fact that you are a human being and that means therefore that they should not be taken away which is why the declaration of independence describes them as unalienable they cannot in fact be taken away they can be violated by a, an unjust government or unjust tyrants or oppressors but you always have those rights because they're given to you by some higher cause or some higher reason, nature, the, the God of nature, the creator, uh, some higher power or cause than, than mere mortals. Why are these, uh, why is it important to understand what natural rights actually means, especially since it's not really a way that we talk about things too much anymore? Yeah, it was really important as a standard in fact, again, I mentioned these sermons. I'm really fascinated by political sermons that are given right around the time of the American Revolution and the American founding. And um, one of the things you see mentioned in a lot of political sermons, um, especially in New England, is the idea that um, without natural rights, all your rights that you might possess as, a, as a, an individual or as a citizen, if you didn't have natural rights, all rights would simply be positive. That is, they would simply be given to you by government or by society, which means um, they can be taken away by government or society, right? If it's not a natural right, it's a conventional right or a positive right. If they can give it to you, they can take it away from you. It's the old, you know, if you're, you're, you're my mom and dad used to tell me all the time, you know, uh, driving the car when I was a teenager was a privilege. They'll give me the car keys, but they can take it away, take them away from me. Uh, when I do something dumb, which I, I did on quite a few occasions, apparently. But um, rights, uh, if you don't have natural rights, then all rights are arbitrary. They can change. One week you can be, you can have this right, the next week you can have that right. And it depends on either whoever is in charge of the government, it could be one person with all power, or it could even be the majority in a more democratic society. Your rights could change from week to week. Natural rights don't change. And therefore, this was the important point that comes across in these sermons, natural rights become, because your natural rights are permanent and they don't change ever, they become a permanent standard by which to judge whether or not government is good or bad. So if you have the natural right to life, uh, liberty, the pursuit of happiness are the three listed in the Declaration of Independence, but there are more, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom to practice religion as you see fit. Uh, the right to acquire property. These are other kinds of natural rights that, that um, according to the American mind at the time of the founding. If those are your rights, 
and the job of government is to protect those rights and not violate them, then you have a standard in those natural rights by which to say, wait a minute, this law is bad. This government is acting unjustly. This is not right. This is a violation of things, you see. If you don't have that, those natural rights as a kind of standard, what other standard do you use to judge whether government is good or bad? You, there are other standards you can use, like it's really efficient in eliminating people it doesn't want to be around, you know, or it's really, um, really good at uh, raising taxes or something like that, right? Or defending its, you know, its territory or going around and conquering others. But natural rights provide a standard for justice. Natural rights tell us this is just, this is unjust when governments violate those natural rights. Uh, that's very helpful. And I was looking at the language of the Declaration of Independence to which you referred us, and it says, in fact, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these you mentioned are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I, it was interesting to me to note that you threw in the right to property, which is a natural right that you have, that says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So the Declaration of Independence seems to say, yeah, that's right. Natural rights are the principle of justice by which we can actually make moral judgments about whether government action or law is good or bad, right or wrong. And it's also the reason why we have government. Yes, that is true. Yeah, <clears throat> We need government to protect our natural rights, you and I as individuals, from violations by other, by other individuals, right? Or even other nations. So government's primary primary job is to protect, to secure our natural rights as citizens. At the same time, it has to be limited. It has to be, uh, by the way, it has to have enough energy to use a Hamiltonian phrase to do those things well, to protect our rights from violation or harm by others. But at the same time, it has to have um, sort of, it has to be limited in what it can do so that it doesn't transgress those rights and, and actually violate the very rights that it's intended to secure. That's a great challenge, by the way, and one in which, one a challenge, by the way, which James Madison recognized as probably the greatest challenge, the greatest difficulty of the framers of the Constitution at the, at the convention in Philadelphia in 1787. So in Federalist, um, I think it's Federalist 37, James Madison writes, uh, that, that maybe the greatest difficulty or challenge faced by the people writing the Constitution was to, on the one hand, make sure that government has enough power to do its job of securing rights and preserving liberty, uh, but on the other hand, making sure that it's not so powerful that it can, that it can violate those rights and, and, and take away that liberty. Finding that balance, writing a Constitution and creating a government that is limited in just the right ways, but not too limited so that it can't secure our rights. That is one of the greatest accomplishments of human beings and human minds, I should say, to, to, to come up with a, a constitution and a government that that so far, I mean, you know, the pendulum has swung back and forth quite a few times over our 200 some years of, of American history, but so far it still is doing, it's still, it's doing a pretty good job of, of finding that balance, so. I was fascinated by something that you said just previously, which was that, um, we, if we understand natural rights pro properly as coming from the laws of nature and nature's God, which is another phrase, right, from the Declaration, um, that that means that government doesn't give us these rights. So sometimes, for example, I'll hear people say, and some of our listeners, I'm sure, have heard this, people will say, oh, well, the Constitution gives you freedom of speech because it's there in the First Amendment. Um, you're shaking your head no at that. What's wrong with saying that? No, government does not give you freedom of speech. It's meant to protect your freedom of speech. It's it's um, it is not the it, it, the the government is not the creator <laughs> of certain natural rights. Um, now, I mean, there have to be limits to to speech. This is dangerous ground, right? And I know you've taught courses on the First Amendment, and so I I say this with a grain of salt. There have to be reasonable. Um, sort of limitations to what can be done in the name of free speech. You can't do something that's dangerous and government can have a say in those things. But the but government does not bestow these rights on you. It doesn't give you the freedom to use your own mind, to think about what to believe with regard to God. It doesn't give you the, the power to form your own opinions, the right to form your own opinions. You have those, those powers, those rights it's already by nature. Even if there were no government, you would have the power and right to do those things. So, um, <clears throat> Government does, by the way, give you some rights, 
but not oh, certain. Oh, really? Natural what, what what kind of rights does it give us then? Well, let me take that back a little bit. When I say government, I want to say actually society through government can bestow certain rights on us as citizens. So as human beings, we have these natural rights that, have, that are simply inherent in us, the freedom, the right to, to think, to speak, to work, to acquire property, and so on and so forth. There are certain um, what they used to call privileges and immunities, sometimes called civil rights or the rights of citizens, that we have as individuals by virtue of being a citizen of this country under this government. So the right yeah, so to- So what would some of those be then? Right to a jury trial, for example. Uh, the right, you know, think of your, your, your rights of trial, the right to, you know, be, uh, um, confront your accusers, the right to call witnesses, the right to a speedy uh, a trial by a jury of your peers. Um, those are rights that you have by virtue of the fact that you are a, a citizen of this, this country or this society. Um, How about voting? The right to vote is a, yeah, that's a big one. Yes. Right. That is voting is not a natural right, believe it or not. Now, now here's the, but, but again, sometimes I like to describe this as, um, take this as an analogy. It has its limits, but like being a citizen is like being a member of a club. And uh, when you're a member of the club, you get the perks that, that come along with, with being a member of the club, so to speak. So by virtue of being an American citizen, you have the privilege or the right to vote, to, to, you, know, to, to you know, the rights of trial, to, to various other things, right? But, um, but those are not natural rights. Those are civic rights, sometimes called privileges and immunities. Privilege is a, is a right that's bestowed on you by society that says you can do something. You, you are guaranteed the freedom to do this as a citizen. A, an immunity is a protection against some sort of government action, right? So government can't uh, search your, your uh, you know, conduct a search of your person uh, that isn't, um, that's unreasonable, for example, right? So you have the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, for example. Now, I, I do want to say this. Americans hold those kinds of rights as citizens to be extraordinarily important because they are considered to be necessary sort of buffers or protections for your natural rights. Our natural rights, again, which are not given to us by government or society, uh, but by nature or the creator, are better protected when we are when we are also have these civic or civil rights, these privileges and immunities. So the reason the right to um, a jury trial is so important is so that your nat so it, it makes it less likely that your natural right to life, liberty, or property, well, to use the, the phrase the, Declar the Constitution uses, so that you're not deprived of life, limb, or property unjustly, right? So, so these civil rights, these civic rights, the rights of citizens exist to better protect our natural rights, but they are, they are different. That, that strikes me as something like the argument that um, Frederick Douglass, the great black abolitionist of the 19th century made, arguing for why the black man should get the, the vote, right? He says, look, we're, we're citizens now, and we need the vote so that we can, of course, learn to govern ourselves after having been enslaved for so long, but also so that we can effectively defend our natural rights of life, liberty, and property. If we can't yeah. vote, we're powerless in some ways to defend those natural rights that we have. That's, that's right, yeah. Um, and by the way, back at the time of the founding, um, you probably know, I know you know this, there were uh, property requirements uh, to, to vote. Um, in 1789, uh, sorry, sorry, 1788, uh, when the U.S. Constitution went into effect, there were property requirements to vote in every state, I believe, at the time. So you had to, either to, to hold office or to vote, you had to hold just a certain amount of, of real property, right, land, essentially. Um, that uh, over the next decade or two started to disappear, those property requirements. And the argument was exactly what, what you were just saying, Frederick Douglass said. V voting may not be a natural right, but it is perhaps the most essential right of a citizen to have some say over the laws and the policies that will affect their natural rights. And so what you saw in light of that kind of argument was these property requirements in virtually every state started to disappear over the next decade or two. Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to have one of our faculty members tell you about a special documents-based graduate program for teachers of American history, government, and civics. Hi, 
This is John Moser, Chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government Program at Ashland University. If you are an educator who teaches U.S. history, government, or politics, our program may be just what you've been looking for. Our approach is to emphasize primary sources, since we think the best way to study the past is to read the words of those who lived it. We have a distinguished faculty made up of professors from both Ashland University and from colleges and universities across the country. And they're not there to lecture to you. We think it's better to learn through conversation about the documents. Ours is a hybrid program with two different types of seminar. The first are our week-long intensive in-person courses during the summers on the beautiful campus of Ashland University. The second are our live synchronous online seminars offered throughout the year. So if you're a social studies teacher and you're looking to deepen your understanding of America's past and its politics, please check out the Master of Arts in American History and Government program. You can do that by visiting tah.org slash programs. So that leads me to the question, when, have this, when has this idea of natural rights been important in American history? Um, I think without that argument, you would not have seen, um, you would not have had a, a, an Abraham Lincoln for example, capable of making the argument that slavery is wrong. Wow, that's a pretty big claim. What do you mean? Well, uh, Lincoln's argument against slavery is that it's a violation of, of the intent of the creator, that, that, um, that uh, all men means all men, regardless of race. Um, all men means all human beings, regardless of race. And that means any form of slavery um, is a violation of of one's natural rights. And Lincoln made that argument pretty clearly and pretty strongly many times throughout his career. So without the idea of natural rights, the only other argument, well, maybe there were some others, but the other main argument that could have been made against slavery is one of, say, inconvenience. It's not necessary. Um, without a, without the, the idea of natural rights, you wouldn't have had Lincoln and other, there were abolitionists, of course, making the same arguments, but Lincoln was probably the best known articulator of these things. But if think about it, if there was no longer the, the idea of natural rights as the standard by which to say slavery was wrong, then what other argument do you make to say, let's get rid of slavery? Again, we don't need it. It's, it's inconvenient. It's more costly to maintain. I mean, I, 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 these are not my arguments. I'm saying, but what arguments could could possibly have been made to to not only get rid of slavery, but also to point out that it's wrong. It's simply unjust. Uh, I think I think that the, the idea of natural rights was vitally important not only to um, to justify the end of slavery and the passage of the Thirteenth Amendment, but vitally important to set up what was to come in terms of what the country should be like after the Civil War and leading into the 20th century. So if, if it was so important in those in that really, really defining moment in American history, I mean, it's striking to me in contemporary American life, have we stopped talking about natural rights? And if we have, why have we? Yeah, I think, um, well, I'll, I'll do it this way. That's such a, that's such a great question. I think sort of the idea of natural rights being used in sort of political discourse, my sense is that it sort of, it was at its low point around the time of the New Deal and maybe just after that. Um, if you read, for example, um, for people listening, if they wanna go back and sample like presidential inaugural addresses or, or State of the Union messages, uh, between 19, between FDR and into the 1970s, um, you, you rarely see presidents making an appeal to natural rights as a standard for what America is and what our vision of the future should be. So, so I think they were at a low point, uh, this talk of natural rights. But I do think that there was a rebound and the idea of natural rights and limited government, by the way, started to come back into popular discourse, public discourse with Ronald Reagan, who I think very intentionally made it a point to put those ideas front and center in his speeches, including, you mentioned earlier, the uh, 50 core docs volume ends with the time for choosing speech by Ronald Reagan given in 1964, as America's considering, do we go down the road of 
the great society uh, or do we sort of remember the idea of limited government? And in that speech, Ronald Reagan reminds us that, that um, uh, if I can remember, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he says somewhere along the line a perversion has taken place. What we used to think of as our, as our natural rights bestowed on us by our creator have become dispensations of government. And so Ronald Reagan, I think, was the first to really bring this idea of natural rights back uh, front and center in, in American public speech and political speech. But I, I do. You, oh, sorry. I was just going to I was just wondering, but, but before Reagan, if you said it started earlier in the 20th century, why did people stop talking, thinking about and talking about natural rights as a standard for politics? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, 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 I'm going to try not to turn this into a discussion of German political philosophy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, please, for everyone's sake, but I won't do that. No, but I will say this, look, there was around the turn of the 20th century, uh, in the late 1900s, early, early 20th century, um, a different way, a, 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 there was a challenger. There was a new way of thinking that challenged sort of the traditional view that uh, Americans believe in natural rights and the role of government, therefore, is limited based on our understanding of those natural rights. So uh, there were there were um, certain th um, thinkers known as progressives um, who had a different view and did not accept natural rights as true. Instead, they believed that our rights were derived from history somehow. And I don't want to get this, I don't want to make this too complicated, but what they meant by that was um, the, the rights that people have depends on the degree to which they have sort of developed and become civilized over time. And uh, there are some societies, if you go back and look at history and how they've developed over history, there are some societies that have become really civilized, like uh, the, the, the Northern Europeans and, and maybe the Americans. And then there are peoples who over time have not evolved or developed to the point of being so civilized. And these new thinkers actually argued that natural rights do not apply to everyone. Well, there are no natural rights, um, but the rights that peoples have depend on the degree to which they've sort of developed over the course of history to be civilized. Again, this is getting a little too abstract, I apologize. But this, by the way, justified um, around the, the turn of the, the 20th century, American intervention in places like Cuba um, and the Philippines, especially, uh, where you had you had progressive thinkers arguing that the Declaration of Independence no longer applies um, because clearly, uh, you know, some people around the world aren't capable of exercising rights equally. They need they need time to to learn how to be free, and in the meantime, it takes uh, somebody like us uh, or the other civilized nations of the world to rule them. Um, so it's about this time that the, that the idea of natural rights is challenged, and instead what you have is the substitution of the idea that rights are all rights are in fact bestowed on a people by society and by government, but the kind of rights they have depends on the extent to which they've become civilized or historically advanced is the phrase they use. So, for example, the example you gave is they, these folks would have argued that um, – only certain people have freedom of speech, and that freedom of speech can change and will change over the course of time. So what was yeah. permitted, well, what was not permitted before can be permitted now, or what was permitted before can be restricted now. The person who believed in natural rights would have said, no, if you have this freedom, you have it, everyone has it, and it's the same freedom, whether it's 1776, 1914, or 2023. You got it. Yeah. And by the way, can I just say that's so that's so that's nice and clear. What that reminds me of is the other really clear statement on this is I think from Calvin Coolidge, who gave a great speech on the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And in this speech, uh, Coolidge points out that before the Declaration of Independence, what you had was the idea, again, under divine right of kings, the idea that if anybody had rights, they were dispensations of the king. They were, you know, privileges that the king gave out and that the king could take away. The Declaration of Independence comes along and we say <clears throat> in that document, no, there are certain rights that are, that are endowed upon us as individuals by God or the creator, right? 
And then Coolidge says, since then, there's been a lot of talk of progress. People have been saying that the Declaration of Independence and natural rights don't matter anymore. They don't apply. And what Coolidge says is, if you believe that, if you reject the idea of natural rights for this newer notion of all rights can change, that's not progress. That's regress. That's going back to the old days of divine right of kings. It's just under a different form. That's all it is. It may be a little friendlier and more benevolent, but in principle, it's no different than the days when King said, you have this right and not that right. I think Coolidge so, says that very clearly. So if we haven't had a president, well, you said Ronald Reagan sort of began to rearticulate this argument in the 1980s. Um, what do you think the status today is of the idea of natural rights? Does it still have any influence out there? Has it been broadly discarded across America? Where do we stand right now in terms of this idea? Yeah, that's great. Can I, that's, before I say something about that, can I just point out again, you, Ronald Reagan, um, when he was, he was elected president, I know you know this, um, he took down the portrait of Woodrow Wilson in the, in the White House. And Woodrow Wilson was one of the, the, the primary people who was making this new, under, this, this new argument for the new kind of rights, right? The new freedom as he called it. And he replaced it with a portrait of Calvin Coolidge, which I think, again, is very huh, simple. I did not know that. No. Oh, yeah. He, he took down Wilson and put Coolidge up in the White House. But um, where do we stand today? Again, I think um, since this idea has been, since there have been a number of, um, of people since Reagan who have who have had the courage uh, and the audacity, I would say, to, to bring this language back up in, in American public discourse, it's um, it is still very strong. Um, it still has, I think, it needs help. The idea needs help, um, and by that I mean <clears throat> um, people need to be reminded of of these things and 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 understand again, which is what we're doing here today, right? We're <clears throat> excuse me, trying to help people understand what those natural rights are and why they're so important. Um, there was also a time in the 1950s when I think any any discussion of these things. In, in schools, high schools or universities would have been laughed at uh, under the umbrella of, um, uh, of, of the new kind of thinking uh, from people like John Dewey and others, right? Uh, anybody who would have invoked the idea of natural rights in a college class in the 1950s would have been laughed at, laughed off campus. But now you find places um, where these things can be openly and freely discussed and taken seriously. And I'm, uh, I can't tell you how, again, lucky I am to, to be here at uh, Ashland University and, and with the Ashbrook Center where we have these kinds of discussions all the time. And, um, and, and they're taken seriously. And um, I think there's a comeback underway with these ideas, which is why I think the work that, that you do, Jeff, and, and, and the other good people at Ashbrook is so important to help remind Americans that this was the American mind and, and still is the American mind. We just have sort of not been educated um, each generation has not been educated um, to, to know these things. I think it's just in some ways it's a memory. It's a matter of memory. It's a matter of forgetting. So for our listeners, because uh, you're the editor of this 50 Core American Documents book, if they want to read something from uh, American history, American core documents that has this idea of natural rights, that talks about it, that argues uh, in favor of it or about it, what documents would you recommend that they read? Yeah, I would say um, just about any of the Lincoln speeches uh, that are in there. Read um, Lincoln's, it's um, in the 50 core docs, it's his speech at Peoria. It's the speech on the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. <clears throat> and uh, th that speech has two purposes. One, Lincoln is not a fan of the, um, 1854 Kansas Nebraska Act, but but beyond that, Lincoln <clears throat> here I think delivers some of his most eloquent defenses of the equal natural rights of all, regardless of race or even um, gender. Uh, believe uh, in this speech, right? Um, so read Lincoln's articulation of and defense of natural rights in this speech, and then jump over to Alexander Stevens' cornerstone speech. Alexander Stevens is the um, vice president of the Confederacy. 
And he makes it very clear that the, the American founders believed deeply in these natural rights and that they applied equally to all human beings, but they were wrong. And he gives his reasons why he thinks natural rights are, are, are a lie. So uh, I, I would start with those two documents and, and read Lincoln's arguments uh, in defense of natural rights as a way to argue that slavery is unjust, and then read uh, Alexander Stevens' uh, rejection of natural rights and his therefore defense of slavery as 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 just and moral. Fascinating. That's that's one place you could look. I mean, there are a number of other uh, great documents where these these ideas come. I suppose up. some of the the documents that you have in here from Woodrow Wilson and Calvin Coolidge, if you want to have that conversation, would be another one. And oh, and uh, on that point, um, yeah, Calvin Coolidge's speech on the 150th anniversary of the Declaration is in this in this collection. <clears throat> excuse me, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points message is in this collection as well. Um, but also Ronald Reagan's speech, A Time for Choosing in 1964, you might look at that and also compare that to uh, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society speech, which is the speech uh, number 49, just before uh, uh, Reagan's speech. And in that speech, Johnson is pretty much calling for an end to limited government. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but when you look at the kinds of things Johnson says government ought to be doing as part of the great society, it you start to wonder where are the limits? What do we believe in any limits to government anymore? Johnson is saying government's going to do this and this and this, and they all sound like great things, right? We're gonna we're gonna fund the arts, we're gonna we're gonna you know end poverty, we're gonna uh, you know uh, improve education. All these are great things, but but at what price? at what cost? And and when Reagan gives the 1964 Time for Choosing speech largely in response to this, that's his point. Um, government can do lots of things and, and some of them sound like, like really good things and are really good things, but you always have to weigh the cost at, uh, at the expense of ending limiting gov limited government or, or, or further expanding the limits, uh, the, the sort of edges or contours of government. There's always a cost, and the cost almost always comes in the form of freedom and natural rights. Mm, fascinating, Chris. Well, thank you so much for helping us to get back into this really important fundamental idea of natural rights and its importance for us as Americans. It's important. It's in our history, but also it's important for our contemporary public life. Chris Berger, thank you so much for taking the time today to join us on The American Idea. Thank you, Jeff. That was fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.